disappointed. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm down in Santa Cruz. So sorry, I can't be with you all in person. It's a little bit far from Santa Cruz to come up for just the evening. But I have a day long with you planned for October in person. So hopefully in a, about a month and a half or so, I'll be with you. So great to have you all here. Um, what we're going to do tonight, the format might be a little bit different than what you usually do on Wednesday nights. What we're going to do, we're going to start with a sitting practice slightly shorter than I think you usually have, because we're going to have another meditation a little bit later in the session. So we're going to start with the settling and setting our intention, some breath awareness practice. Then we're going to go into a discussion of the topic for the evening, then have another guided meditation on the topic that I'll guide you through a contemplation, more of a conceptual contemplation. Then we'll have a little bit of time to talk to each other in breakout rooms about what came up during the meditation and then come back to the bigger room for some discussion. So I think that's slightly different from your usual format, but we'll go ahead and start with a sitting practice as a way to just arrive in the space and settle in at the end of a long day, making sure that we're not only relaxed, but present and also focused. And so I'm gonna invite you to find a comfortable posture wherever you're sitting, whether you're sitting up in a chair or maybe on a sofa or on a cushion, either in the Dharma Collective or at home. And settling into your posture, I'll invite you to conjoin the qualities of alertness and relaxation. And we get alertness by having a nice upright spine feeling as if there were a cord kind of pulling up from the crown of our head or as if our spine were a stack of coins stacked up. As much as possible, getting that upright posture, but your body relaxed around that. And for our sitting posture, it's helpful to have our shoulders even. Your hands can be resting in your lap or resting on your knees. Your eyes can either be closed or slightly open. If you tend to get sleepy, you can keep your eyes a little bit open in kind of a hooded gaze. If you have your tongue on the roof of your mouth right behind your teeth, that keeps you from having to swallow constantly. And your legs either crossed comfortably or if you're sitting up in a chair, having your feet flat on the floor to give you a nice stable posture so you don't have to keep adjusting your balance. And then before we move our attention to the sensations of the breath, let's just take a moment to do a body scan. So starting at the crown of the head, sweeping down through the body, relaxing, releasing, checking for any tension, check the area around the eyes. We often hold a lot of tension in our forehead around our eyes, trying to deliberately relax there. Relaxing your jaw. Generally, we breathe through our nose with our mouth closed when we're meditating, but with our jaw not tight or clenched. And relaxing your neck and shoulders. Sweeping your attention down through your torso, relaxing your belly. Opening up the sternum, getting that nice upright posture, lifting your chest, but your body relaxed around that. Relaxing your buttocks. Relaxing your legs all the way down to your feet. And then let's round off this initial settling of the body with three deep breaths. So three deep inhalations all the way down to the diaphragm, deep exhalation. And this activates the soothing system of our body, gets ourselves activated for calm and 
centered and focused. And then let's turn our attention to the ordinary sensations of breathing in the body, the sensations of the breath, wherever we can follow the most easily. It might be the full body awareness of breathing. It might be localized in either the diaphragm, the chest, or the nostrils. So just choosing a point of focus or allowing yourself to have a wide angle focus of the whole body and the sensations that accompany the breath. Let's practice like this for some moments, bringing our attention back to the breath. If we get caught up in a thought, distracted by a sound or another sense object, so just releasing and returning, returning to the breath. using the breath as an anchor to get ourselves here in this room, in our bodies, in the present moment. And just releasing and returning to the sensations of the breath. Release the distraction, the thoughts, the sounds. Bring your attention back over and over to the sensations of the breath. And then let's take a moment to set our motivation for our time together this evening. So just taking a moment to reflect on what brought you here this evening. 
what intention, what motivation, perhaps you're a regular at Well of Being Wednesdays, perhaps you come and go, maybe this evening felt the need for community or uh, some time to engage in meditation practice, hear some dharma, whatever it might be, we say we get the most out of a session of dharma practice or study or meditation, if we set a clear intention at the beginning of the session, we're just taking a moment to think of what you'd like to receive this evening, what you'd like to experience, what brought you here. And then traditionally, we always try to set an altruistic intention for our time together, thinking, may whatever I receive tonight, whatever insights, whatever experience I have in meditation or discussion with others, may it benefit not just myself, but may it bring benefit to others as well. So setting an intention that whatever you experience is also beneficial for other beings as well. Thank you for your practice. And I'd love to invite the people who are joining on Zoom, if it's possible to turn your cameras on, that would be great because it's, I can't really see the people in the physical room too well. So it's nice to speak to faces. Thank you very much for turning your cameras on. And so When Eve invited me to teach tonight, she said that you all, for those of you that are regulars at Well of Being Wednesday, have been going through a study of Thich Nhat Hanh's beautiful book, Old Path, White Clouds. For a number of years, I would lead pilgrimages to the Buddhist holy places in India and Nepal. And I would always advise that as a pre-trip reading so that people would become familiar with Lord Buddha's life and some of the places where he taught that we would be visiting on pilgrimage, and that was a wonderful experience. So she said that you had been talking about the story of Angulimala and touching on the topic of forgiveness. And so what I thought would be really interesting to explore this evening is the differences between forgiveness and reconciliation and what the Buddha advised about both of these things, because they're not the same thing. And I found in my own life, and I think in working with students, sometimes we hesitate to forgive because we think that it means reconciliation with the person who may have done us harm. And so the Buddha really differentiated these two things and said, there can be both in the context of one relationship, but not necessarily at all. And so I want to talk about the advice he gave. He recommended both of these practices But fortunately for us, gave a lot of very specific instruction about how to go about forgiving and reconciling. In the Pali scriptures, there's a couple of quotes that I want to begin with. And so in, in one Pali scripture, he said, these two are fools. Which two? The one who doesn't see his or her transgression as a transgression 
and the one who doesn't rightfully pardon another who has confessed their transgression, these two are fools. These two are wise. Which two? The one who sees their transgression as a transgression, and the one who rightfully pardons another who has confessed their transgression, these two are wise. And so there's a relationship here between actually seeing that we've made a transgression. And so the pardoning of the other person is seems to be, from what the Buddha says, very dependent on the other person actually seeing that they have made a transgression. And this is one of the qualities that leads to reconciliation. And so the Pali word for forgiveness, kama, also means the earth. And so this indicates that the mind is like the earth, unperturbed, kind of an equanimity, non-reactive. And when you forgive someone for harming you, what that means is you're deciding not to retaliate and not to seek revenge. And so this gives you peace of mind. So the mind like the earth, unperturbed, that you're just letting go of thoughts of retaliation, thoughts of getting back at the person. It doesn't mean that you have to like the person and it doesn't mean you have to continue a relationship with the person. There's a beautiful book called The Art, I think it's called The Art of Forgiving by Bishop Desmond Tutu, the late Bishop Desmond Tutu. And in that book, he talks about four steps to forgiveness. He talks about naming the hurt that the act has caused you. And then the last step is either renewing or releasing the relationship. And so he says, after we forgive, we first have to name the hurt and name what happened to us and then move through these other steps to forgive the other person. But then he said, at the end, we have the choice to either renew or release the relationship. And so that's important. And I think I notice for myself when I hesitate to forgive, it's because somehow I feel like I need to let the person back in again, right? Like I need to let them close to me again. And I was like, oh, no, that's scary. That really hurt this thing that happened. And so reconciliation is something different. And it's dependent on a reestablishment of trust. And the word in Pali means a return to amicability, right? So it requires a reestablishment of trust. So that's beyond just forgiveness, which is just letting go of a need to retaliate. It's an extra step that can happen kind of on top of forgiveness. And so for the reestablishment of trust to happen, there are a couple of things that really need to happen. The person who has done the harm needs to take responsibility for their actions. They need to actually admit that the thing that they did was wrong or caused harm, right? And then they also need to somehow acknowledge the hurt that was caused and acknowledge that the other person's feelings matter. And then sometimes there's uh, there needs to be some sort of a assurance that it won't happen again. And we're not perfect. And it's not to say that we can always promise that it'll never happen again. And then, you know, we're held to it. But some sort of promise to the other person, you know, I'll really try hard. I get it. I get it that that thing I did hurt you and I get that it was wrong, you know, of me to do that and it really hurt you and I see that there was harm done and so I'll do my best not to do it again. And so that can lead to reconciliation. So there's this quality of apology and we're going to talk a little bit about what the Buddha said and then compare and contrast with what some modern psychologists say is an effective apology. 
is pretty much identical. The Buddha 2,500 years ago, all the psychologists who've done all the research and PhD dissertations, they didn't need to do that, really. All they needed to do was read the Buddhist scripture because the list of what makes an effective apology, pretty much exactly what the Buddha said we need to do for reconciliation. And so for reconciliation, the first step in every case is the acknowledgement of wrongdoing. And these are steps that are taken from the monastic code. The monastic code not only has the vows that monastics are meant to keep, but it has lots and lots and lots of advice, an equal amount of advice about how to live in community and how to get along with other people and how to share things and how to repair wrongs. Tons of conflict resolution strategies. So this comes from some of the advice about how to live in community in the monastic code. So the first step, so this is monastics confessing to other monastics, but it also works for lay people as well. So acknowledging the wrongdoing. And so the first is admitting to having done the thing, right? You can't really reconcile if you don't admit that you did whatever the thing that was the, the harmful act was. And then acknowledging that it was an offense, acknowledging that it did do harm. And to reestablish trust, there needs to be some view that you both have a shared set of values. It's really hard to trust other people if they if you feel like the other people aren't really sharing your ethical values, isn't it? Because they can behave in a way that they think is ethically completely appropriate, but it may be really harmful for you if you just don't even set the same the same set of values. I was talking to a friend the other day and we we're talking about People lying to you, and we're, I, we we're both saying that funny thing that we don't think other people are going to do what we don't do. Like if you tend not to tell lies, it doesn't even occur to you. And so you get completely confused when somebody is lying to you because you're like, something feels off and it doesn't make sense. And some, But I don't understand what's happening. We kind of self-gaslight because it doesn't occur to us that somebody else would behave in a way ethically so different from the way we behave. So in order to really have trust in a relationship, this idea that you have a shared set of values is really important. And then finally, the promise to try to refrain from repeating the offense in the future. And so there's that idea that, you know, as much as possible, the person is going to not do it again. And so Reconciliation can't be based simply on a wish for harmony. It requires a mutual understanding of what actions serve to create disharmony and a promise to try and avoid those actions in the future, right? And so this requires a commitment to mutual standards of right and wrong. And so this is really interesting because in our friendships, we often don't have these conversations with other people. If we share a spiritual path, there might be an assumption, for example, if your friends are Buddhist or you share another spiritual path that you share the values of that spiritual tradition. But often in our friendships, we don't actually hang out talking about ethics, do we? And what our standards are for you know, our behavior. And like my friend and I with the lying, you just make assumptions about other people's values that sometimes turn out not to be true at all. There's this beautiful exercise I like to do in groups a lot. Some of you may have done it with me. And it's an exercise in exploring our core values. And it's a great exercise to do in any number of different groups. I do it in conflict resolution classes that I do and discussing what your core values are. Because just like my friend and I with the lying, you assume that we all share the same values. And then when you hear about someone else's core values and why are those values really important to them, 
it can be so interesting. It can actually deepen closeness and relationship. And so I think, you know, when we're in relationship with people, having some of these conversations can be really helpful because I think it can really deepen and establish trust. And so modern psychologists and and sociologists have it, have identified five basic strategies that people use to avoid accepting responsibility and blame when they've caused harm. And all of the teachings the Buddha taught about how to reconcile actually oppose all of these strategies. So I thought it was interesting. I want to read these strategies, the five things that people do to try and avoid blame. And we can all think of circumstances and even public, you know, public, uh, examples of wrongdoing where people have used these strategies. The first is to de deny responsibility, right? Didn't do it. Wasn't me. Nope. Somebody else. I didn't do it. You know, There's somebody who happens to be, how many indictments are we up to now who's denying all responsibility for any of those actions, right? To deny that harm was actually done. That's another one. Oh, it was no big deal. Come on, why are you making such a big deal out of it, right? So to belittle or deny that harm was done, to deny the worth of the victim. So this is really interesting. A lot of the victim blaming, or if a victim is in a relationship of a one down power relationship, often people can be taken advantage of because people are denying the worth of the victim or blaming the victim to attack the accuser, that's another one. And we can see in a lot of these, I think of the Me Too movement, all of the victim blaming that happened when people who were powerful were being accused of sexual abuse. And then to claim that they were acting in the service of a higher cause. Isn't that interesting? So this isn't even from Buddhism. This is just from psychologists and sociologists talking about denying responsibility. And so the Buddhist teachings as a response to these strategies, we're always responsible for our conscious choices. We can never deny responsibility for our conscious choices. We should always put ourselves in the other person's place. So always have empathy. So denying that harm was actually done is counteracted by empathy and by putting ourselves in the other person's shoes all beings are worthy of respect, the Buddha taught. So denying the worth of the victim, right, is counteracted by that. And we should regard people who point out our faults as if they were pointing out our treasure. And the Buddhist teachings are full of this. There's all kinds of Lojong teachings in the Tibetan tradition that says, oh, the person who criticizes me is my greatest guru. And we're like, what? But the person who points out our faults, right, we see as our greatest teacher and they're pointing out our greatest treasure. And this is another approach that the Buddha talked about. He said, if we actually acknowledge our wrongdoing, instead of being a cause of shame, it's a cause of praise. And he talked about this a lot in the sutras. And he said, somebody who really admits their wrongdoing and admits their faults is totally worthy of praise instead of shame, right? But we often respond with shame when we feel that we've done something wrong. But the Buddha says admitting it is actually the way that we can transform. And then being grateful to the person who points out our faults. And then there's no higher purposes that excuse base, breaking the basic precepts of ethical conduct and harming another person. Okay, so the idea of oh, the greater good, I had to harm the person because it was better in the long run for the greater good. That's a tricky one. And the Buddha's like, nope, not really. There's no excuse for breaking those kind of precepts. And so by pointing out this path to reconciliation, this one Buddhist scholar called uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, and he put it really beautifully. He says, in the distinction between reconciliation and forgiveness is so important. He says it encourages us not to settle for mere forgiveness, 
when the genuine healing of right reconciliation is possible, and it allows us to be generous with our forgiveness even when it is not. Isn't that beautiful? So not to settle for mere forgiveness when we can actually move towards reconciliation, but to be generous with our forgiveness even when reconciliation isn't possible. So to go back to Bishop Desmond Tutu, this idea of we can choose to either renew or release the relationship after forgiveness. So forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation. It might be possible, but the Buddha said sometimes there isn't enough of a basis of shared values. Sometimes the person will not acknowledge the wrongdoing. Sometimes they won't do anything to give you any guarantee that it's not going to happen again. So all these bases for reconciliation just aren't there. So reconciliation may not be possible. But the Buddha said forgiveness is always possible, even if reconciliation isn't. And it just is letting go of our own need for retaliation and resentment. So I want to refer to another teaching, this time by modern psychologists, and then I'll pause and we can have a little discussion because some questions might have come up. There's a, a, a wonderful book called On Apology by a researcher called Aaron Lazar. And I read his whole book and love the way it dovetails so much with what the Buddha taught about reconciliation. So as you can see from what I've talked about so far about this approach to reconciliation, it really depends on an apology. Forgiveness doesn't require apology, but reconciliation pretty much does, right? The person really needs to make a sincere apology. And so Aaron Lazar has written an entire book based on his research about what components make an effective apology. And so I want to go into some of those because they're really pretty much the same list as the Buddhist list. And so Aaron, Aaron Lazar says, first of all, an effective apology should express remorse, sometimes in the form of humility on the part of the apologizer, right? So it's taking responsibility for the harm. And then an apology should acknowledge the offense and accept a sense of accepting responsibility for the wrongdoing on the part of the apologizer. And then an apology should be empathetic. It should convey an understanding of the feelings that have come out of being harmed by the action of the offender. Apology should include a sort of intent to undo the harm a sense of reparation or willingness to offer some sort of compensation for the harm that's been done. And finally, an apology that's effective should convey a feeling that the possibility that this is going to happen again is reduced. So it has all those components we've been talking about. Acknowledge that the person has done the harm, acknowledge that it is harmful and connect with the experience of the person who has been harmed. And then some sort of a guarantee that it's not going to happen again. And in this one, it's interesting. There's a sense of reparation or offering some sort of compensation for the harm done. And I work, I work with an organization where I live in Santa Cruz that does a lot of restorative justice processes. And all of these are also components of restorative justice. When we're trying to do restorative justice instead of punitive justice, in, in certain circumstances, all of these elements need to be in there on the part of the party who's done the harm in order to have a restorative justice process, including them doing something to make up for the harm that was done, right? Some sort of reparation for the harm that was done. And so Aaron Lazar says, all of these parts of an effective apology, how they serve to build trust again with the person who is harmed, it says, first of all, it restores a sense of dignity of the person who was harmed, right? And then it affirms that both parties have shared values and agree that the harm was wrong. And then this is really important for rebuilding a sense of trust and safety. 
and validates that the victim was not responsible for the offense, because that can happen often too with victim blaming. Oh, you brought it on yourself, right? So it affirms that the victim was not responsible. And it validates that the offended party is safe from a repeated offense. I'm not going to have this experience again. So maybe I can rebuild trust with this person because they've told me that's not going to happen again. And some sort of reparative justice, the person who's apologizing is making some kind of sacrifice or incurring some sort of punishment for their wrongdoing, and the victim is compensated in some way. And this part isn't in the Buddhist teachings, but it's interesting to consider because it is in restorative justice processes. And an effective apology, and this might be the most important part, it offers an opportunity for the two parties to dialogue. So the offended party can express their feelings towards the offender and even grieve their losses over what the offender has taken away from them, something like their feeling of safety and their feeling of trust. So it allows for dialogue. And in restorative justice, often one part of the process is engaging in victim-offender dialogue when both parties are ready, you know, sometimes years and years and years later in cases like that. But with dialogue between the two parties, that's a huge part of restoring trust. So it's really interesting to see how these ideas from modern psychology really kind of resonate with some of the ideas from the Buddhist teachings about how to how to reconcile with someone who's harmed us or how we can reconcile with someone that we've harmed above and beyond forgiveness. It can be the next step, but only can be if all of these conditions are met. So in a minute, we're gonna do another practice where we're gonna actually contemplate times that we have been apologized to, or maybe times that we've apologized and how did it feel and did it have the apology have some of these components? But I want to pause now and see if there's any questions or comments or reflections, anything to clarify. And if you raise your hand and I'll ask whoever's in the physical room to kind of watch who's in the room, if there's any questions. I hear, I see hands waving in the physical room. Please call out. Um, am I supposed to talk into the microphone? I can hear you. That's good. Okay. If you can hear me, then people at home can hear. I'm wondering, you kind of touched on this, but where the differentiation between whether it was an, something that was done with the intention to be mean, to be harmful, or whether it was just a, something that was just negligence or then the other dimension of the, the higher power. The, it seems to me there's like three kind of little buckets that it could fall into. Tell me more about the higher power and what that bucket is. Well, that was what you, uh, I did it because, okay, an example would be um, people who, are defending uh, the right to life, which oh, you know, right, right. Uh, they're they're causing serious harm to people because of their higher values. They're trying. They're yeah. They believe that that what they are serving uh, supersedes other people's needs, and it's causing harm. Right. right. Okay, so and then there's just the like, I'm a bumbling idiot and I didn't realize that I just walked across your tulip bed and killed all the flowers that you just spent the day planting. Oops, my bad. Or, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I don't like you and I'm going to sneak in in the middle of the night and dig up your tulips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's look at the first two first. The first two being, it was intentional or not intentional. What do you think about the difference if the, the component of acknowledging that 
there was harm that was done, right? So even the person who did it maliciously gets to the point of acknowledging that it was wrong and that harm was done and admitting, or the person who did it unintentionally. What do you think the difference between those two are if the person does those steps? Do you think there's a big difference about whether it was intentional or not? Well, where I think that comes into play for me is uh, allowing them back in as opposed to just forgiving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That if, you know, I'm, and yeah, it's like if, if you did it maliciously, I'm going to be less likely to trust you again. Whereas if it was just um, negligence. Yeah. That, yeah. So let me ask you this. So if the person who did it maliciously recognizes that it was an act of harm, expresses that they're, you know, that they take responsibility, that it was an act of harm, they have empathy that they understand that it, how much it harmed you and assure you it won't happen again. If all of those steps are taken, is it still hard to trust them, even though initially way back in the beginning they did it maliciously? I'm going to be much more cautious with yeah. that than with someone who did it accidentally. Okay, yeah. And, and, and then I think, yeah, go ahead. And then I think it gets into the, uh, you know, uh, hurt me once, shame on you, hurt me twice, shame on me. If it keeps happening, yeah. you know, the definition of insanity is uh, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So if they keep repeating uh, events, then I'm going to set a boundary. So... I don't know. For me, I wonder, and I'm just going to throw this out there. If someone has done all the hard work on themselves to transform and realize that the actions that they've done have been harmful and take responsibility and have remorse. I don't know. I I would almost trust them more because I feel like they've really thought it through so much more than somebody who's just bumbling around and says, oh, sorry, sorry, I trampled your tulips it's just interesting and i think you're right if we trust people and let them back in before they've gone through all, all their steps yeah then it's on us we're just not setting a good boundary if we reestablish trust with someone who hasn't expressed remorse at all or gone through any of those steps then maybe not so wise right but almost, I mean, and I guess I've known people who've gone through all of that hard work and really faced up to things that they've done in the past and felt sincere remorse and done the hard work and done as many reparations as they can. I almost feel like I would trust them more because they've given it more thought, you know, than they've really done the hard work. Just throwing it out there. I mean, I totally hear what you're saying, but it is interesting to think of people who have who have gone through some sort of restorative process or, you know, really acknowledge a, a serious wrongdoing. Yeah. And then the people who are just trying to make choices for all of us that aren't in alignment with our own values. That's where I think there isn't enough basis maybe for reconciliation, but there is for forgiveness. I mean, are we going to have a conversation with that person and reconcile with that person, but we can accept and forgive them and have compassion for them at the very least, even if they're doing things that we find to be harmful to us and to others. You know, we may not have an opportunity to get them to change their ways necessarily into something that, you know, isn't as harmful, but it is interesting, like you say, according to their values, what they're doing is preventing harm. 
So it's a disconnect and not the same shared values in a way, or not the same same shared worldview. So it's harder in that situation to have a like some kind of reconciliation. But I think compassion and forgiveness, even for people who publicly cause harm, is possible. And setting boundaries and not letting them harm us as much as possible and still speaking out against things like injustice if we feel like they're engaged in that too. Yeah, great question. Great question. I think just sitting with that question of who can you reconcile with more the person who's harmed maliciously, who's had a change of heart, or the person who did it. I mean, for sure, for from their side, I think the person who did the harm accidentally can easily get to the point of apologizing about it with all of those factors of a good apology. Like for them, they're like, oh my God, I didn't even know I did it. It was dark and I trampled your tulips. So from their side, they might be able to get to that point of making an effective apology immediately. For the other person, it may take a lot longer to get to that point. Yeah. And that makes me have one final thought and then I really love to shut up. <laughs> And I'm dealing with someone right now who is in a position of authority. She's bullying and she thinks that uh, her behavior is appropriate and that she's keeping order. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so uh, I come at it from the perspective of she was probably treated in that way. Yeah. She probably you know, it hurt people, hurt people. So, you know, she, I don't know what her experience has been of being bullied that now she treats other people this way. Yeah. And sometimes for a situation like that, if you feel it's effective and can do it in a non-shaming way, like really expressing to the person the impact of their behavior can be helpful if there's any kind of relationship there and you think they won't just be triggered to defensiveness and there's a way you can do it in a non-shaming way. But sometimes people aren't really aware of the impact of their actions on others and they would have empathy. They're just sort of clueless and not really reading the room, right? And so they may not really understand the impact of their actions. So I think always trying to, you know, and there's great ways of learning how to express it through nonviolent communication and things like that. You can kind of learn how to do it in a way that will reduce the person's defensiveness. But sometimes I've been in situations like that and the person is like, oh, just completely unaware of the impact of their communication style on others. Or like you say, they're just trying to control the situation out of their own fear and just sort of like lost in this sort of spiral of fear that makes them clamp down and be controlling. But you can kind of break through that sometimes with just expressing to them how that situation makes you feel. And it can lead to a conversation that that shifts the energy sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your thoughts. Well, one final thought, uh, because I was not going to say anything to anybody. I was just going to suck it up. And then it happened again. And fortunately, we have someone who is an expert on nonviolent communication, and I was able to consult with him. But if I didn't, it just got to the point where I felt like I had to say something, because if I let her keep getting away with it, I am complicit because I can take care of myself, but there are gonna be people in this environment who don't necessarily, they're more vulnerable. And I felt more like, less, less like it's about me and more like, I gotta be responsible for the community. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we sometimes are so conflict avoidant, but seeing conflict is just natural and actually, uh, opportunity to find out more and actually deepen relationship and connection, which isn't usually the way we think about conflict, but that, you know, if we change our approach to conflict, it can be an opportunity to even go deeper and communicate more 
deeply and honestly in the future. But we have to overcome our conflict avoidance by learning skills about how to deal with situations like that. And just like you say, for the greater good. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Ted. Your hand is up. I'm unmuting Ted right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for unmuting me. Um, I have never, this is the, maybe I've heard it, but it really sunk in the um, acknowledgement of shared values mm. in terms of, of apology and um, reconciliation. I have, uh, I, that it just seems so um, fundamental to me. And yet I hadn't even, it hadn't even occurred to me. I mean, so many apologies are made without even acknowledging that. Yeah, yeah. Explicitly acknowledging that. I'm I'm in the middle of a of a of a disagreement or a situation in a personal relationship, and I just think that could be so helpful to to me. Yeah. To have that discussion, um, and so thank you. Um, and on in in a broader sense, boy, does that seem to be um, a, a a point of view a a, a problem in so yeah. a larger, you know, in a societal. Um, it just that that I see where so many hurts are caused and felt by that lack of common commonality. I guess. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you, Ted. You know, and I think it is one of those things. We never have those conversations. We make so many assumptions that other people are sharing our values with rarely explicitly naming them. I did a, I was just doing a training with this group of people who work in this, in this big nonprofit in Santa Cruz that, that tries to find shelter for unhoused people. And it was their sort of middle management group and they were wanting some trainings and various things. And I had them do this core values exercise together and they kept talking. We worked together for a couple of weeks and they kept talking about how, you know, talking about their values with each other increased their closeness and their commitment to each other and their sort of solidified them as a team more than any other kind of team building thing that they'd ever done. It was so powerful. And it was just this sort of 15 minute exercise where you first do a written reflection on some of your important core values and then share it and then reflect back what you've heard the other person say. And they said it deepened the intimacy in that group. Um, they found it quite extraordinary, actually, and it was a really simple thing, but they were like, we've worked together for years, and we've never once ever had this conversation. This was, like, mind-blowing. Well, I mean, I have a situation with my partner, and I don't know, so um, when somebody comes over, um, she wants me to... Um, greet them, say hello. She. Th this is somebody who's been invited by her yeah. and I might be doing something else. And she is upset if I don't say, come over and say hello immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just realizing that I don't, it's not a shared, I don't know yeah. if I'm petty in the, this thinking, but it doesn't seem like it's a shared value and that might be something we need to talk about because for me if i come over and somebody's doing something else and they don't say hi i'm okay big deal right 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 that's not why I, you know it's okay but for her that's a real that's a huge that's really important it's yeah really important and i don't know how to i don't know how to cope with that right now to be yeah. honest so well it's interesting i was just having this conversation with someone yesterday from Mexico, and he was just saying, greeting people is so important in Latin American culture. Like it's super rude. Like if a Latin American would never not greet, like that would be the rudest thing to keep going about your business if somebody came 
over to your house, even if they weren't visiting you, you would definitely get up and go greet them. You know, so part of it is like, we all have our own cultures, even if we're not from another country or whatever, but we all have our own way of doing things. And so kind of having the curiosity to find out, especially if it's somebody that you're living with and sharing space with to see, wow, what's rude for you and what's polite for you. And maybe you can meet somewhere in the middle with that, you know, because you don't have it. You come from different backgrounds. It's, you know, it's not wrong that you don't feel that way. But for her, obviously, it's really important and just kind of coming to some agreements about what what are the values for your shared life together? Like you've got your values, she's got her values. What's the shared values that you're going to operate your collective life according to? Interesting. It might be fun. I mean, get curious about it, right? <laughs> it's like a, another level of discovery. Yeah. So let's do a little practice. What I'd love to do is guide you through a contemplation and ask you to draw from memory of a time that you apologized, a time you were apologized to. And did you feel that reconciliation was possible? And possibly it was because all of those components of an effective apology might not have been there. Sometimes someone apologizes to us and we still are holding resentment and we can't really feel that we want to be close to them again. Maybe some of these elements were missing. So we'll explore a little bit. Then we'll have a chance to talk in small groups for about 10 minutes. I'll ask the people in the room to organize themselves and I'll organize the Zoomiverse into little groups of three for some conversation just about what came up. And then we'll come back to the bigger group and hear from a few people. So I'll guide you through, this will be more of a conceptual meditation practice where I'll guide you through with some prompts and then pause and then just think through after I prompt you and see what comes up from your own experience. And in order to for these meditations to be powerful, it's helpful if they're as personal as possible. And then in your small group, you'll only share what you feel comfortable sharing. You won't necessarily be sharing anything that you don't feel comfortable with. And you'll have confidentiality in the small groups, but just see what comes up. So first settling back into your meditation posture with your back straight and your shoulders even. And then settling with the breath again, we won't go through the whole body scan, but just taking a moment to settle in with the body and with the breath. And so now for the first part of the practice, think of a time that someone apologized to you for something and you felt like even though they apologized, it was hard to forgive them. So draw from your memory a time where somebody apologized, but you felt like it didn't really, didn't really work. It didn't really make you feel that you could forgive them, didn't really renew any kind of sense of closeness. Take a moment, if there are a few examples, just try and bring to mind the one that maybe happened the most recently or maybe is a really powerful experience for you. And then thinking back on that episode, 
did the person express sincere remorse? You feel like they really felt a sense of remorse about what they had done. And did they acknowledge the offense and accept responsibility? Did they offer you empathy? Did you feel that they had an understanding of the impact of their behavior on you? Of how you felt? And did they offer to somehow undo the harm or offer compensation or some kind of reparation for the harm that was done? And did you feel reassured that it wouldn't happen again? Do you feel that when they apologized to you, you had some assurance that the harm wouldn't happen again? And then in thinking of all of these factors and thinking of that situation, can you imagine if you found that one of these factors was missing, if the person had been able to include that factor in their apology, might you have felt differently? For example, if they didn't really acknowledge 
the harm that was done to you didn't really offer you empathy. If they did, how much you have felt different? Would it have changed your willingness to forgive and reconcile with that person? And now think of another situation. And in this case, it may be that you need to apologize to someone for something, that you need to make amends to someone. And maybe you've hesitated to do it because you just don't really know how. Maybe you've hesitated to do it because you're afraid of getting it wrong, afraid that they won't forgive you. So now that we've learned the components of an effective apology. So thinking of this, can you imagine or almost rehearse what you might say or do in that situation? So if you have an example like this, bring it to mind, maybe something small, maybe something big, but you feel that you need to apologize and reconcile with someone in your life. Conflict is normal. We often have people we've had a conflict with that is outstanding. We don't know what to do about it. So how might you express sincere remorse? How about acknowledging the offense and accepting responsibility? How would you express empathy to the other person? Express an understanding of what it is that they went through. Is there anything that you could do to undo the harm or offer compensation? And what might you say to reassure the other person that it wouldn't happen again?
And as you imagine that conversation, imagine reconciling with that person. And even going deeper in your relationship because of going through this process. That it's given you a chance to have this dialogue. And we'll bring this brief practice to a close. And so I'm going to invite you into small groups for about 10 minutes. And in your groups, you don't have to share the details of the situation, but anything that you realized, any insight you had into perhaps what might make an effective apology or something that was missing. For example, Ted mentioned this new idea of shared values, maybe you know, empathy with the person was a new idea or somehow assuring them that the harm wouldn't happen again. So whatever it is that came up for you in this exploration. And we have a, a guideline of confidentiality in the small groups also. So when we come back to the larger group, don't say anything that anyone in your small group said back in the big group, just talk about your own experience. So whatever gets discussed in the small group stays in the small group. When we ask you don't share outside of this space in any way that would identify one of the speakers. So I'm going to send you off the people in the Zoom room, the people in the physical room. I think there's probably enough people for maybe two groups. Okay, I think we're all back. And there was a question that came up in the chat that I noticed while you all were in your rooms. How does oh, one live yeah. with not being forgiven? Now. Yeah. Okay. That's really hard. Not being forgiven. That can be so painful, right? And there's nothing we can do to make someone forgive us. And I think, you know, I was thinking about this question after reading it, and I was thinking, you know, having compassion for the person that we've harmed that feels so unsafe that they can't, don't feel that they can forgive us. And just realizing it comes out of their need to feel safe. And somehow we've done something to violate their safety generally is what it is. Because often, like I said, Sometimes we think that forgiveness means reconciliation, right? And so the person is like still holding us, you know, at a distance because we don't feel safe to them. And we can have so much compassion for that because it's a valid human need. And I think for me, I mean, I've had this happen in my life and there's people I haven't forgiven for a long time. And it can change if the person hasn't passed you know, always holding out hope. There's people that I've forgiven long after a harm was done because I just had to go through my own personal process and get to the point where I was ready to have the conversation with them. And, you know, so always holding out that it might change in the future and learning what it, you know, the impact of that to me kind of reinforces my wish to be a safe person for people to be around. So I don't, you know, we all have conflicts, but like as much as possible to, you know, express to people what my values are and that I care about them and their feelings in a way that it, you know, if there is a conflict, it doesn't lead to that kind of a breach that would mean that forgiveness wasn't possible. But it's so painful. It's so painful. So I really hear the you know, the pain of that when we 
when when we're not in control and and the other person hasn't forgiven us so thank you for that question yeah so we've got time for maybe a couple of comments if anything came up in your discussion or anything that really was a new learning for you in this discussion about reconciliation and apology anything to share you can just raise your raise your hand anybody in the zoom averse or the 3d room Jorge, I see you. <laughs> I know you've got something to share. Now we need um, to, there we go. I knew it. Hey, okay. nice haircut. <laughs> okay. Um, Come close uh, to the mic, bro. I can't hear okay. you. I got you. I got you. Um, okay, uh, a lot of these steps, most people, in my experience, uh, so I don't know if I don't know if I'm actually making a statement for most people, but they, most people don't really are able to admit this. So as we're going through these steps for apologies um, or or re reconciliation with other persons, are we setting the bar a little bit too high? <laughs> Well, it's just what works, you know? I mean, we we can forgive without all these steps. But like I said, what the Buddha taught and what modern psychologists have researched and found really creates the conditions for reconciliation are the same. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, kind of learning these steps makes me know what I need to engage in myself and it overcomes my confusion about when it hasn't worked, like the first part of the meditation. When has somebody apologized to you and you just feel like, no, oh I still can't, I still don't want to be close to them. Like one of these things was missing. So I think when we know these steps, we can even be braver about the way we communicate with other people in our life if we've been harmed or caused harm. And really, you know, have more of a conversation because most of us have never learned, like you say, I mean, we haven't learned anything about conflict resolution. We just think conflict in a relationship is a disaster and means the relationship is going to be over. So like learning these steps, I don't think it makes it harder. I think it, these are the steps that actually work to lead to reconciliation. The more we know these steps the more we can engage in them our, ourselves and maybe communicate to other people and maybe teach each other, you know, and help kind of coach each other. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, just hold each other accountable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because we're not and we don't know what to do. I mean, there's so many times in my life where there's been a conflict and I am like a black belt conflict avoider in recovery, but it's a slippery slope. <laughs> You know, and had to learn all of these techniques and still I'm not great. I just want to flee. Like when there's a conflict, I just fully want to absolutely run away. But I've learned in my old age, that doesn't work. And it's better to, and through experience, how much going through these hard conversations actually deepens trust and deepens relationship. I have a friend who's actually a professional mediator now, I remember 30 years ago when we first started to be friends, she said, I don't believe in a relationship unless, unless we've gone through a really major conflict and survived. I freaked yeah. out. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> right? And now I totally know what she means. Right. Because you prove that you can really, you know, you're committed to the relationship enough to have all the hard conversations and move through it to reconciliation then you know you've got trust, right? So it deepens it in a way. I don't know, you know, but it's it's really counterintuitive and it's certainly not the way that we were ever really raised or trained, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got one more question. Yeah. I, I understand the part of forgiving people. In fact, today I was actually plotting to go to war with one of my coworkers, but- Uh-oh. I'm over here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know um let me guess no just kidding no 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 it's not her um, <laughs> uh, um 
So I, this coworker that I have, uh, she's been causing those problems and uh, from my department. And I was, I literally said, what, what, what you want, what, what you can get. But um, uh, probably is not the best idea. Uh, so how do you relate with somebody that's belligerent and it's not going to apologize? I mean, I understand you could forgive them, but how do you relate to them, especially when you got to work with them? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, one of the things that it's sort of like the person that isn't forgiving us and the person who's acting out in relation to us, for me, if I can get an insight into some, what are they needing that is being frustrated? Like if somebody is acting belligerent and angry, it's usually some unfulfilled need that they have which is often one of the big three basic ones, safety, belonging, or dignity or respect, right? And if we can intuit and somehow talk to them about it or or intuit what is not being fulfilled, and often anger is a response to some feeling of vulnerability. So again, it's the empathy piece of trying to put yourself in their shoes. Why is it that they're acting the way they can? Maybe even giving them empathy and talking about it and reflecting how they're feeling and going, wow, you're really upset today. Wow. You know, what's going on? And and just, you know, mostly when people are acting belligerent, they drive everyone else away. And sometimes they have a need for belonging that's not being fulfilled. So their behavior backfires and everybody runs away. So sometimes actually approaching somebody who's angry and belligerent and trying to really give them kindness and empathy can kind of break through and then they could be safe expressing their vulnerability. But it takes no. a lot of courage. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for your questions. All right. So we're at time already. That went so fast. So much to say about apologizing and reconciliation, but hopefully you've gotten a couple of ideas from tonight's talk, a couple of new approaches, because like I said, conflict is just part of human relationship, but the more we can learn about moving through it with empathy and leading to deeper connection, then the better off we're all going to be. So thank you so much for coming tonight. And I look forward to seeing everyone in the collective in three dimensions in October when I'm up there. I think it's October 21st is the date we've settled on. So look forward to seeing you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming.